Hello and welcome to, to this episode of Cloudbytes Conversations. Um, I'm here today with Amit Chowdhury. Amit is a Salesforce MVP. Uh, he runs one of the biggest YouTube channels on uh, Salesforce. He's uh, an MVP Hall of Fame member. He's an author. Amit's one of the most interesting people that's out there in the Salesforce ecosystem. He's got a lot of experience and stories, and I'm really pleased to have Amit here today with us. So welcome to the podcast, Amit. Thank you so much for having me in your show. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, you've been nice enough to have me on Apex Hours a couple of times. So uh, it's it's good for kind of it to be the other way around and kind of the roles reversed. So, um, so yeah, thank you for coming on to the podcast. As I mentioned, you know, you've been working with Salesforce for a long time. You've got loads of experience. So uh, for those listening or watching, would you be able to give us a bit of a background as to uh, you know, when you got started in Salesforce, how you got started in Salesforce, and you know, kind of a bit of a story about your journey into, into the ecosystem? Yeah, so the journey is, uh, to be very frank, it started around 2009 and 10. So initially, I was a Java trainer. So very less people know. I did lots of corporate training. So I used to train Java and I was a certified people and working on the Java platform as a developer as well. And then over the time I get opportunity for one of the, uh, one of the project, uh, uh, one of the company for Salesforce. And I got an interview. They say, come for the interview. I say, what is SFDC? They say, like, uh, this is a cloud-based computing system. And I was not aware about what is that. I Google it, did not find anything on a Google too much about that uh, that time. And then uh, I went for an interview somewhere else. And my interview got over early. So that other company who was conducting the interview, they were on the way. So I thought, OK, let's go there and see, because they were taking the interview in Java. So I went there, gave my interview. And after that, uh, next day, I got a call. Hey, you are selected you have to join and uh, you need to work. So that time I, I was not sure what is Salesforce. The most of the people were saying, hey, don't join the tool base. Java is the future. You can build anything. Salesforce is also built on a Java. And uh, if you go based on a tool, if the tool is not successful, you will lose everything. I say, OK, let's go and start and see something. Because the only th one thing was my, in my mind is a cloud computing. And we know that feature. And uh, I entered in the, uh, into the Salesforce world that time with my intention, hey, I will be entering into the big company, big MNC company. And over the time, uh, if the, I don't like it, I can always do the internal switch but from SFDC to the Java or another technology. And then, uh, then I uh, started uh, there as a learning because that time there was no trailer. There was very <laughs> little blog post was there. And there was very less content. The only content to learn was the recruitment app, app uh, book, workbook. So if, if the people started their career, they know. So that time, uh, uh, S Control was there, and the Visual Force was recently launched. So we were doing the study by self because there was no content. So we did it by ourselves, did the book. And uh, when I see the Apex was actually same like Java. And mm -hmm. uh, over the uh, on the other hand. Uh, uh, visual force space was just look like uh, GSP for me and I say hey, it's very easy because uh, because when I was in Java I used I need to you make the connection JDBC connection make the spring boot hibernate and all these things I was using in the Java to make the connection with the data and uh, pull it into the screen and show something but in the Salesforce it was very easy so that actually make my interest and when I start working on that and I simply love the Salesforce so that is how my journey started in the same process. No, it's uh, so. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting for a few reasons because. So I, I'm I'm also of a of a vintage that I remember the the workbook, the little paper workbook. So for those who, those who um, are newer to the platform, these workbooks haven't been around for about ten years now, if not longer. Um, and they were they were a physical book, weren't they? Um, so you used to get. Every company had like five or six printed ones. And then if you went to a world tour or to Dreamforce, you'd come back. And whereas now you get nice plushy Astros, back then you used to come back with a bag heavy full of all these workbooks and kind of, um, do you remember the plastic laminated sheets as well, the cheat sheets? Yep. Yep. So, yeah, so, yep. It's, uh, so there was a lot of, lot of paper and a lot of, uh, lot of uh, carbon footprint originally on some of these things. But um, 
But what's what I find really interesting about that is is the fact that you were a Java trainer, because mm -hmm. you know when I um, one of the things that I found about doing Apex training and Visual Force training when I was doing them for Salesforce was that you really have to you know, it really forces you to know what you're on about. You know, you cannot be a trainer without um, without deep knowledge of it. So it must have been it must have been an even more kind of severe jump for you being such a Java expert and then jumping over to Salesforce where it, you know, as you say, it was kind of really a stripped down, stripped down version of Java almost. Yep. So, yeah. so yeah, so it's a, that's an impressive, impressive jump across to make. And, uh, and yeah, I agree with you the whole, it is, it's funny when, uh, when you say about the, the feedback from people about Salesforce, you know, this Salesforce thing is very kind of lightweight. I had the same thing. I came from C sharp. And had the same thing of people telling me it's very lightweight in comparison. Exactly. We feel, that time you compare C sharp or ASP, almost same. Yeah. Compare it here. Yeah. No, it's a, it was a big, big leap. So, so obviously you moved across then and started doing Salesforce. Um, and yeah, how long did it take you before you decided there was, you know, you were never going back to Java then? Because again, you know, being a Java trainer, you were, I mean, you were very, very kind of Java expert expert level. You know, how uh, how long did it take before you were like, nope, never going back? That's uh, like uh, to be very frank. It take me like almost a year to decide because I was keep continuing over there. I I, I want to continue my passion into the Java, and uh, parallelly what I was doing that time, I was like, okay, I was still working as a developer, but teaching someone as a free of course into Java because I don't want to get out of the touch with Java. And I don't want over the time I will be lose the bot of Java. But then to be very frank, after e two year, uh, like uh, after two year and three year, like I move, I never look into the Java back again because then I was completely in love with the Salesforce when the Visual Force space kick off. Otherwise, you know, when I started, it was a it's a time of S control. Mm -hmm. So when the Visual Force space come and that was a uh, like uh, what I say. That make lots of things easy. That make the platform more robust. So we were th that time like it was really easy for us to build any UI and modify the Salesforce screen for the client. So when it's come, then I simply say, okay, I'm not going away from the coding. And as long as I'm doing coding, I'm fine. Yeah. So no, yeah, that's. I mean, I think Visual Force. Um, although Visual Force has a bad reputation nowadays, I think. Uh, I think a lot of developers kind of view it as legacy and old because quite reasonably it is the older version. It um it was it was such a huge thing at the time. And uh and if you've ever I mean for anyone who's never worked with an S control, consider yourself lucky. Um because they were they were a very strange bit of technology, weren't they? Is uh you could still there were until like only a few years ago, there were still orgs I was a coming across with the bit. It's uh it's crazy. I think I, I think if you I still have it all where the S control was written. Yeah, it's it's mad, absolutely mad that they were in there. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's good that they were gone. Um, so yeah, so okay, so that that's that's interesting. That took you a couple. Of, uh, have you have you never written any Java since then, or uh, no, no, no more Java after that. No more Java after that. Not even not even as a hobby. Not even just for your own fun. I definitely train some kids in a school, but yeah. uh, no more job after that. Okay, cool. So that's that's a, that's a big, big thing to leave behind. That suddenly exactly. that, that makes sense. And so, so you're working away in Salesforce. So you started started working with Salesforce. Started kind of falling in love with it. And uh, yeah, my my big one that I I tell everyone about is that I'm always happy. I never had to write a login page again um, because login pages are like. You've written one user management system. You've written them all, um, but you know, sort of uh, part way through. So you were working in India at the time, and then you moved across to the US. Was that because yeah. Salesforce was much bigger in the US at the time, or did you just fancy a move? Or okay, so that story is also interesting. So, uh, like to be very frank, I started working around two thousand nine and ten in Salesforce. I mm -hmm. moved in United States in two thousand sixteen. So yeah. after yeah, so there was like to be very frank, I was working for one of the big MNC company over that time. My project was interesting, so I was like uh, in 2014, 
I got a project for automobile company where the front end user was uh, car drivers, not the uh, anyone. So I was excited. Hey, how it will be built? It Salesforce is like a browser based application, and the car driver will be driving this, and that will be the front end for them. So uh, we were not sure how to implement that because that was the very first automobile project for uh, in Salesforce, and we are implementing. So I was like started there as a senior developer and then become an architect in the same project and the project was critical so i worked for there like uh, implemented for north america then for canada then we roll out that project for 27 country uh, in uh, europe and then the project was come for the china so it was big rollout so over the time the project demand me to be there in a client office mm -hmm. so that is the reason i move out from india to us okay cool and was that um was that the, I'm trying to remember, I remember Mark Benioff at one of the Dreamforces or something doing a demo. Yeah. Was it was it Toyota or Hyundai? Something like that? Toyota? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, that was a General Motor. General so, Motors, that was it. Was so that the project you, remember, you were working on? Yeah, so if you ever remember, right, if you go anywhere, you always see a car into Dreamforce. Yeah. Over there, so that was my project. So, oh, cool. That's, I mean, that must be quite nice as well, though, being able to see something that you built being like on stage with Mark Benioff. That's a, that's a cool moment, Matt. So that was like exciting thing. And uh, over the time, I learned a lot. There were lots of API work. There were lots of custom work. That actually kicked off my career. Okay, cool. And I think, I think that's a, an interesting thing there because, yeah, and uh, what, I'd, what I'd love to know is, did you... When you were doing, when you when you say it kicked off your career and you learned a lot, when you started out the project, did you feel did you feel ready for it, or do you feel that sometimes you need to you need to challenge yourself and do something that's a little bit outside your comfort zone to get there? Okay, so that's an interesting thing. Right? So let me tell you. So when I started in two thousand nine and ten, and I was learning, I started. I got a project. We started implementing. And over the time, like of, after one and two years, I feel there was no learning for me in uh, that particular project because mm -hmm. the project was smooth, it was running after go live, you know how it goes. And I was trying to learn. There was no trail at that time. And uh, book wise, there was very less book in the market and really hard to learn. So what I started that time, I start looking into the developer forum. So mm -hmm. if very less people know or like old people know who work in that time. So I started contributing. I started reading the question on a uh, developer form and posting the answer. So I, uh, so as I say, like I was a hardcore developer. So I did not did in a success community. I went on a developer community. I read the code, did that R and D in my developer org and posted the code for that. That's what I used to do. And then I started posting. That way I start learning. And then that is the way I learned something which I was not doing in my project because I read the problem from the other people's, try to solve it by myself and then post a solution. That way I learned. And once I come into this project, there was something new because I always want to do some kind of integration work. And, uh, you know, at that time, there was very less integration project was there around uh, 2012 I'm talking about. And this was one of the biggest uh, integrated project. I don't know how many system chip based integration and all of this kind of thing we were doing. And once I get opportunity, and uh, yes, uh, I did not did this kind of work in my past, like connecting the car, working with IoT devices and all these things. And uh, that actually, in that particular way, I learned lots of things, how to communicate with a different system and how to integrate the Salesforce with a different system. Otherwise, before to that, I was just doing the UI development on uh, Visual Force Space and Apex. But here I learned overall architectures that actually uh, make uh, make my thought process change and uh, coming from a module based come as an enterprise level and thinking from the big landscape because before to that where i was working most of them are small project but that was one of the enterprise project and once you come into the enterprise level project the lot you learn so that was my first enterprise level project where the team size was more than 100 plus people that time mm -hmm. No, it makes all the sense. And yeah, I, I completely agree that um, when you when you end up getting onto you can you can do big you can do projects sort of a decent size where you're doing an integration or two. And and I think nowadays, because um, back if you were doing that 2012 time, 
I'm trying to think that was probably even before like REST was supported on Salesforce. Mm-hmm. So it was, everything would have been SOAP, which uh, if you've, you know, for those who haven't done a SOAP integration, they're a, they're quite a heavyweight, aren't they? I think is the polite way of putting it. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely agree that like nowadays, nowadays connecting systems is a lot easier and, you know, it's, it's a, you know, thankfully a lot quicker. Because that you're in one of those situations where there's you know, 10 or 11 different systems, five or six different architects, 10 or 11 different patterns, and you've got sync it, sync timing. Yeah, I remember um, one of the projects I learned, um, learned a lot on was a project I did where there was, <coughs> excuse me, a, a website, marketing cloud, which I wasn't in charge of either of those, and Salesforce and another system. And just just the timing between like the website signs you up via marketing cloud that comes over to Salesforce that creates your password in a different system and you're kind of just sitting down and working out how long it takes for a person to get their password and you know kind of it's easy when it's just diagrams on a on a whiteboard is it because it's just an arrow and you go oh the arrow just says yeah it's fine but uh sitting down and thinking out well actually if it's three seconds there and ten seconds there and you know it really really makes you start to think about things in a different way i think so okay that's that's really really interesting that um that that was kind of your first big enterprise and such a cool one to work on as well that's cool so so let's fast forward a little bit then so you so 2012 you do uh you start working on this big enterprise project and you know it goes very successfully um you know as we both mentioned it, it was a standout story that was featured at dreamforce and things like that so congratulations on that that's an incredible uh, kind of accolade for you to get um around you know, a few years later around 2017 i think it was you started apex hours and that's probably where most people are going to know you from um it's one of one or two or three places i think people will know you from but I think there's a lot of people who know you from Apex Hours. So, so tell me about tell tell people about Apex Hours and why you started Apex Hours off. Yeah. So uh, as you know, right? Uh, I just say like in 2016, I moved mm. into my district, and that time, to be very frank, I landed in Michigan, and uh, the, it's a two snow. Uh, it's a snowy place. There are lots of snow. And uh, I come here, I was having homesickness. I was not having there any friend. New country, not having driving lessons, not having friends. And uh, I was struggling. Mm-hmm. Not, uh, as a personally, like I was not having someone to talk. And that time to be very thing, I say what to do. As you know, I was already connected with the community by the developer form, posting the answer and all. That time, a idea kicked off to me. Let's start a developer group. So there, I can make some friends, some people, some common Salesforce people will become and connected with us and talk us like we'll have some group. So that time I started a Farmington Hill developer group into the uh, Michigan, and then uh, I was not aware anyone will be sure. I set up a group. I don't have no place. I don't have. Uh, I was not having car. I was not having anything, and I don't have a place to what to do. So I I register group. I set up a first meetup into the startup. It was actually 2.3 mile away from my home. And there was too much snow that day. And I walked from my place to there for 2.3 mile all the way to the Starbucks and sit there. Luckily, three, four guys show up. Okay. And they come because that time we were not using this Brevi uh, uh, platform. We were using meetup yeah. for the developer. So meetup people see, they come up, they show up, we talk about what Salesforce, there are some student from uh, an arbor come up, we have a word, we say like, hey, as I, you know, I am I was a trainer before, so that was in my blood, I say, okay, I want to make a friend, they say, I want to learn, I say, okay, I will teach you, I will definitely teach you and I will help you, and then one of the guy come, they say, hey, I can offer you my office, you can come there next time. So that you can have a whiteboard and all we can do study. I say, okay, done. And they were nice guys. While coming back, they dropped me at home. They know I don't have a car. I have mm-hmm. to take Uber. And once you come, you don't have money too to take Uber, right? So that was the phase I was that time. And then I make some friends. There were some nice guys. They pick me up. I go there. I train them into Salesforce, into Apex and all. I was training. I training was done. Admin training was done. Now, 
more people come up uh, over the time in you know, like two to three months more people show up and i was about to start an apex training so they were saying hey we want to learn and that time snow was hard and uh, i come from a hot temperature and then uh, minus 40 30 is <laughs> too much for me then i think can do recording and uh, recorded session so i don't need to repeat the same thing so that time like we started uh, uh, doing that zoom meeting recording the sessions and sharing the recording and over the time people were asking we were using uh, gmail and there was only 15 gb of data you can leverage then we have to put the recording somewhere and we started uh, using youtube to put our recording over there so that people can we can share with them they can watch and that was the plan we did it and uh, that way we started and over the time when we are doing it a couple of more people started hey amit you are doing great we can also join your journey and uh, lots of other people also joined we started doing online session because the weather was cold sometimes weather was too bad uh, just because of storm and all so that's way like uh, we i have to create a youtube channel and give some name so what i was doing i was giving the training on apex they training them and we give them name as apex hour and glad like there was like around nine and ten students were there we trained them all of them free of course and out of ten nine people got the job in sale for that time out of that oh, wow. yeah and that is how the journey started and once the people got a job they come to my place i'm still in touch with all of them and there i make a lifelong friends and uh, that actually bring the journey so uh, i was had selfish reason to make the apex hour to bring make some friends that time and that is successful and today uh, i'm happily say i have 100000 plus friends on my apex hour youtube that's incredible so um so if you'd have lived in miami and not in michigan you wouldn't yeah. have had that, ended up with apex hours just because of the weather it's uh, that's yeah. cool um, so that, see, I that, mean, like, previously there was no virtual, nobody was doing virtual and we no, started no, it, 2016 as a virtual, 17, 2016, 17 as a virtual session and across the world, we connected with everyone. Mohit was there for first of initial session, Mohit, uh, uh, our friend, uh, Daniel, Daniel Peter was there, Jitendra Jha was there. They were the initial people who started our journey. They connect. I connected them across the world. They were in a different state. They come, present it, and it was like uh, people like it and uh, people enjoyed it. And we are still getting the love from everyone from the community, especially our speaker and audience. Like we are trying our best to produce great content, and that is what is keep going. So it's a community-driven program for the community and by the community. That's incredible. And yeah, um, for those who haven't. I, I don't, but I mean, I'm going to be really honest. I don't think there's going to be anyone listening or watching who hasn't heard of Apex Hours. But if you haven't, really do go and check it out because the the breadth of content on there is is incredible. You know, and and you deserve a lot of a lot of plaudits and a lot of congratulations for kind of getting it started and and you know keeping it consistent because you you know, every week or every couple of weeks you have have a new session on there. Yeah, you get people out there talking and sharing. And it's a great, um, I think one of the things that's really nice about it as well is the fact that it allows others to share their content. Um, so, you know, you deserve, a, you deserve a huge round of applause and, um, you know, thanks from all, all of the community for getting Apex Hours up and running. And, and as you say, you're now 107,000 subscribers, I think I saw on there. So uh, that's a huge, huge one of people. Do you... Do you find that certain content resonates more with people or less with people, or you know, is is it? Do you have a lot of because um, what you know? One of the things that yeah. So uh, for those that aren't aware, I have been on Apex Hours a couple of times over the past few years, um, and it's always a great thing to go and speak at and attend, and uh, I love doing it. Um, but you know, you so as a as a funny sort of story for for the listener you might remember this habit um when you asked me to speak last year i was like yep would love to and uh, do you remember what i sent in as my suggestion for a topic yep i remember uh i guess we did something on epic uh ep performance yes and what was the problem with me doing that yeah is yeah. uh i'd already spoken on that same topic about two years prior um for apex hours um, 
And so the, I think one of the things that um, I'm always interested to, to kind of ask is, and I think, I think it's really tough for anyone trying to come up with something is, is to come up with an idea for something. And I know that, um, you know, we just had, I think at the time of recording, I think it was last week that all of the Dreamforce uh, emails went out for people, for speakers. Um, and, you know, if you've ever submitted a talk for Dreamforce or for London's Calling or India Dreaming or insert community or you know, Salesforce conference here, there's a lot of competition. It's hard to come up with an idea. So, so yeah, I'd be really interested to know, do you find certain things work better and get more interest um, and you know, more kind of viewing and watch hours? You know, what, what do you think works best for coming up with ideas and, and, and things that people like to see? I will only say your content talk. If your content is good, you don't need to worry about anything. And if you are providing the quality of content, the retention of your audience is important. So if your content is good, your uh, people will be, uh, your audience will be enjoyed it. And once you know the whatever the content will become, it's a good, people enjoyed it. So that's a key we always focus, content, trust on the speaker, giving this new speaker and all speaker equally chance to grow into the community. So mm -hmm. that is what the key for us. But okay, in, short, well, that's... in short, like being on a community side, as we say, like we are doing for the community, by the community. So we never face any challenge on this kind of thing because we equally promoted all the other dreaming events and everything on our platform. Yeah. So no, when we are dreaming come, we supported them. When London dreaming come, we supported them. So it's a community. So we each supported each of each of them. So that's a good thing in the sale for seekers. No, that's cool. And and do you um one of the, one of the one of the things I like about Apex Hours is all of the content is quite long form as well. You know, it's sort of 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour long um kind of sessions rather than, you know, I'm I, I and I will hold my hands up. I am terrible for this nowadays, like everyone, in that you just you know, you pick up your phone and you're on YouTube Shorts or Instagram, and yeah, you know, there's those wonderful little short reels that give you the dopamine hit. You know, um, have you when you've been working with people sharing their their ideas and things? Have you have you ever found people have said to you they prefer shorter content or want more short content, or do you just find that long long content is kind of what people are after because of the technical nature? So to be very frank, right, we were part of the technical natures. So we want we we never focus. It doesn't mean we do not focus. Uh, our thing was that if we are starting the topic, go in deep as much as we can go. And sometimes we see there was some people come here. I did a presentation in there where we got only twenty minutes. I say here it's hours. So that is why we never see hour. It's s. So we allowed multi long sessions, and that is what the motive we were having from the starting. Start from the beginning and take it toward the deep and bring something don't talk in general go to the deep and bring something which is come with experience and that what will become when the speaker have some time so that was we focus but yep uh, uh, the short content is still great no doubt about it but uh, for us like definitely we have lots of lots of lots of long videos two hour one hour yeah, no, and I, 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 there was a big conversation um, a couple of months back around on 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 LinkedIn, um, in which uh, yeah, and I wrote a blog post about a few people about you know kind of where that deep technical content for Salesforce has gone, and I think Apex Hours is one of those really good channels that still still is striving to do that, and it was a really interesting conversation um, because there were there were a number of different content creators and you know people like myself and. Uh, you know, different different teams that were going on there and talking about it and saying about um, about the best way of providing content for people. So yeah, I I, I agree that it's good to have a deep area um, and to do it. And is and the advantage the long one? If you see, there are lots of uh, old session we have where the content finish in one hour, and we have a forty minute Q and A. Yeah. 40 minute Q&A, we give an equal chance to audience to ask the question. And once the conversation started, the quality come out of it. Yes. Okay. That's a, that's an interesting point as well, because I suppose it's a good way of interacting with people and getting them that you can't, 
that you don't often get on the video side of things. Yeah. That's cool. So have you, so the, for, again, for the, for those at home, is the focus for Apex Hours still kind of highly technical developer and architect content? Or have you, have you found yourself doing, one of the things I think in Salesforce that's happened over the year, I mean, since definitely for yourself since 2009, for myself since about 2010 and 11, is that when I, yeah, when we started off, there was very much developer and admin. And I feel that those two roles are now merging and blending a lot with the thing, with you know, the advent of flow um, and making it much easier to do some of the programmatic style work as an admin or a, or, you know, or a functional person. Um, on, I mean, you know, Apex Hours has Apex in the name. Obviously, you know, your focus at the start was purely on Apex. Are you taking on more more of the functional side of things? Because you're Velocity certified as well, aren't you, as well? So how have you found bringing some of the broader platform pieces in as you've grown? Yeah, so definitely, very good question. That's a people always have a, uh, with the, if the people go with the name as Apex Hour, they always think for, Apex Hour is only for uh, coding. But if you go on YouTube and search for Flow, you will find the most popular uh, uh, playlist from the Apex Hour itself. So we, if you like, we, we we not only focus on coding, we have all the content for all the training. So we so far did 13 end to end training where 25,000 people register and learn. We have a training for Salesforce admin. We have a training for advanced admin. We have a training for uh, Apex, we have a training for LWC, we have a training for Omni Studio, we have a training for Sales Cloud, we have a, a training for Service Cloud, we have a training for Marketing Cloud, pretty much on Pardot, every content is there. It's not only coding, we have lots of configuration content also on our platform, end to end. If you go there, we have like 13 and 14 sessions, it's a complete training. We, let's, you will find on any other topic on Safe, uh, Apex Hour, so it's not only admin content, we have admin developer, architect, and advanced developer, all type of content we producing. Initially, yes, we focus on developer only, but right now there are lots of content. Even there are lots of talk for career oriented as well. How to make your career, how to get your first job, and how to do. So currently we are focusing on all the kind of content. We welcome everyone who want to talk on any topic. Okay, that's cool. And that must be quite interesting for yourself then because there's you know one of the things that i think is very hard nowadays is to try and keep try and keep on top of salesforce as a platform you know it's um it just gets bigger and bigger so yeah for yourself as well listening into the talks as you go through and do them you must you must learn something you know new all the time yep ah cool that's awesome so so obviously um apex hours very popular grew a lot grew very well um and was probably one of the key things that, you know, alongside your work with the um, developer forums where, yeah, it must have at some point just been you and uh, Bob Buzzard answering questions and fighting each other for it, I imagine. Um, <laughs> um, so, and so, you know, you then were made an MVP back in 2016, I think it was. Uh, yes, around 16 and 17, same time, 17, 16, yes, almost. Super. And so you were so you were made a Salesforce MVP and you were an MVP for eight years and then moved on to the Hall of Fame. Um, what was it like you know, becoming an MVP? How did you find it? You know, what was it like being because obviously I imagine you were connected and knew most of the MVPs anyway before that. But you know, describe for me what it was like becoming an MVP and kind of getting that recognition at the time. So to be very frank, right? Uh, I was posting the question and answer on the developer form from 2012. And I was not aware what is MVP that time. Trust me. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say like me and Bob Bazaar were answering questions over there. So we were like in the we were like almost there, and we were posting the question and answer, and like we were always having the top most best answer in the form that time. And we keep posting. And trust me, I was not aware anything about uh, MVP that time. And uh, from the 2012 to 2016, I was keep posting, and there was around. Uh, almost like uh, uh, 1,500 or 2,700 best answer I posted on developer form that time. And I, I never know, I never, I was not on anywhere on the social media. I was not on Twitter. I was not on LinkedIn. Uh, I was like, I was not using that. And over the time uh, I got to know about this program in 2017, uh, 
uh, or 16, actually 16, when someone nominated me from this group when we trained, and that time I become MVP. And that time I was got to know around uh, this program is there. And uh, before to that, I was not aware. So my takeaway for this is like, if if you if you do something for community, the thing will be come out. Never focus on title. And trust me, I was not aware about the title at all that time. No, I, I think that's a really, really important thing uh, to share and to say. I because one of the so one of the things that um, so I, I first of all I'd like to very much, um, very much second your point about the fact that you should be doing doing things for the want of doing them, not to become an MVP. I think if you do them to become an MVP, you're doing things for the wrong reason. Um, and because it's, you know, to, to peek a little bit behind the curtain for those that aren't Salesforce MVPs, um, it's a it's a lovely honor, isn't it? I mean, I mean, it's you know, it's very nice, and we both have plaques that we can share, and I've got you know some little badges somewhere. Um, so even like uh, even if you're talking about left plate and badges, I still remember the student once they get the job, one of them come up and he bring the wine for me, and as a as a gift for me hey i got a job i still have that wine at my home i never drink it and that is that is really like uh, more important for me as in terms of a trophy or title because that what he bring from his first salary and that was the biggest gift for me and when somebody come give you something like that and say i got a job because of you and give a blessing and i still remember that her huh, that is more important and that is bigger than MVP. And once you do all these things, you're already MVP. That is what my thought process is. That's that's a really good way of looking at it. And yeah, I think, yeah, what I was going to say was the, I think for I think being an MVP is often seen as you get this special status, whereas really, um, really it's yeah, you, you kind of get a congratulations and you get access to a Slack channel and a couple of minor benefits. But it's not it's not a life changing thing. Yeah. I'm I'm afraid to break the news to anyone that Salesforce don't come and give you a big check for you know a hundred thousand dollars or something. Call you. I mean, I'd love. I really wish if if anyone from the MVP team is listening right now and wants to make it so that you know Amit and I are both due big checks, um, then great. But yeah, it's it should be something that is there for doing something that you do, irrespective. And I think one of the interesting things that I've seen over the past. Past few years, I think, hopefully, is changing now. But there was a period where, and I don't know if you noticed this, um, but it became very much a kind of um, a personal branding personality thing, rather than a rather than a how much you'd given thing. And there were some people that you know um, I noticed who weren't getting it, who who deserved it, but just weren't weren't posting all the time on Twitter and LinkedIn. And there were some people who I noticed who were kind of posting all the time on Twitter and LinkedIn and got this kind of status where they thought they should have been an MVP because they were doing a lot of posting, but not anything actually valuable. It's a, it's an interesting conundrum. Yeah, that's a, uh, it's again mindset, right? Uh, what I say, if you do good, it will come automatically. And But if you only want to become it for the title, that's the wrong way. Because once you do it, it's not you should showing that I deserve. It should community should think about you deserve. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So and and one of the things like, lots of people don't know me. People know Apex Hour, and that is the that is called branding. It's not about personal branding. It's a community branding. No, and I think it's it's really interesting when you say about not being very prominent on LinkedIn or Twitter because um, I'm pretty sure. The, and I'd have to go and check this, so please forgive me any other people listening to this, but Apex Hours has to be the biggest Salesforce channel. I mean, non-officials. I mean, the Salesforce developer channel, obviously, is a different beast because that has a couple of million dollars of branding and marketing behind it. But is is Apex Hours the biggest non-official channel? It's bigger uh, than... I think you're bigger than Salesforce, Ben. Yes, we are. <laughs> and that's yeah, and yeah, the Salesforce Ben team do some wonderful content. We've had um, 
Uh, we had Christine on here a few weeks ago. Yeah, I, I work a lot with the team. They're fantastic. Um, so I don't what, know. I, what I'm saying, right? Uh, the key behind Epic Sour is the community. And we, we never spend money. We never make money. It's a community power. We never do anything on a branding, marketing, paid marketing and anything. What we come up is the audience love and our speaker love and passion to uh, create the content for the community. And that is the key for us. And we keep doing it. No, it's, I'm, I'm, it's, it's super commendable and, and really, really good. It's uh... because like if you see right behind the scene, we don't have any team. And um, we are the only, uh, uh, we are the only few, uh, like one person and two person who are running all the show. That's it. And uh, apart from that, we have a very big team of the community. People like you, people like uh, Daniel, uh, people like everyone come us and uh, uh, across the Salesforce ecosystem and they come. So far, we have like almost 200 plus speakers in Apex Hour who come up and share their knowledge. We did more than 600 videos. So that's all about community love and uh, community passion to share the knowledge. No, that's it's 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 truly inspiring to see. Um, like yeah. We don't have a single video which is edited by a video editor. It's all Zoom meeting recording, nothing it's else. Straight recordings. Yeah. That's so you you were in there in the past, right? So you know what we do. We do a meeting on Zoom Zoom meeting, and we just posted the Zoom meeting recording without any editing, and people love it because the content, because the love, because the passion, the people bring. So, and we never edit any video. Trust me, we don't have a single video editor. That's okay. This is, uh, I mean, I probably should have asked you to airbrush my face a little bit when you when I was on there last time, just to make me look a bit younger. But uh, so the so um, one of the other things that you've just done recently um, that is quite a new endeavor for you is is you've just had a book released um, uh, a little bit over six weeks ago, I think. Um, yep. Something like that, maybe seven weeks. Um, called Architecting Salesforce Success. So, so first of all, congratulations on getting the book published. Um, I, I, can, I can share with people that anyone who has got a book published has sacrificed a great amount of time and energy in getting it out there. It, it is like, it, it is an incredible amount of effort, isn't it, to get, get it written and get it done. So congratulations on that. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about the book, why you wrote it, what its contents are. Um, I have my copy on order, so there will be a book review soon when it arrives through. Um, but yeah, tell us about the book. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. So then lots of people reach out to me. They're always asking me, hey, I want to become an architect and how to become an architect. I see lots of people in a market, four years of experience people, just going in exam, clear application architect, integration architect exam, and then I'm an architect. I have all the certification, four years and three years. How you get it? They, yeah, I did some study. I did something this and that and that and that. I, did you get the knowledge? No. Okay. Then I talked to a few people who are working on a platform from last 15 years and 16 years. They're still saying I'm a developer. I say, why are you a developer? You're doing everything what an architect do. A, I, I, I'm not confident enough to handle the pressure to take in decision, but I say you are doing everything what what you're supposed to do it. Okay, then there is a mindset gap. Four year people is not saying that I'm an architect, and another 15 year people is saying I'm not an architect. I'm a developer. I want to write a code a whole life. I enjoy that. So it's a mindset. So those things, those pointer I bring into this book. A like what should be your pathway what you should focus it's more and all like mindset part the thing you should focus i interview a few guys and put in their thought process what the mistake is normal architect do what the as a being an architect what's the mistake you did in initial career what you should not do it how you should do it what's your learning path should be there that kind of point are included and uh, trust me that i don't want to write a like 300 page of book for that because that will be too much theory and people don't love it. People are, when you are looking for guidance, people are looking for, which I can explain in two and three hours. So I my con I want to write a content to the point, to the things. So that is why I wrote a small short book. So initially I was planning to make a report. It's not a book. So the report is a small handbook kind of thing which people can follow. 
and that have a principles what you should follow what mistakes people do it what kind of empathy you should bring your mind what kind of thought process you should have what should be your mind process because architect is nothing is a mindset so that everything i try to cover to the point so that if you are already architect i'm assuming you have already have a learning attitude and you can learn anything but only thing what you need to set is the mindset and once you have it you are all you are already architect so that's, that's a, the key pointer I bring into that book. I think that's a really interesting, um, interesting way of looking at it because there is, I think, there's two sides to this. So one is that I think that Salesforce has fallen into the Salesforce kind of ecosystem has fallen into fallen into one of the similar traps that many ecosystems fall into of, you know, you're a developer and then you're an architect or you're a consultant or an admin and then you're an architect and an architect is a level above even though particularly on salesforce as you say you can be a senior developer and actually be doing more architectural decisions than many architects do um just depending upon the project and where you are so i, I think that there is that i think that the, certif the certification landscape perhaps doesn't help things either because you know every everyone needs to get certs all the but, time but again right how you clear the certification that matter some people learn and do the certification. Some people don't like uh, using the wrong way to clear the exam using the terms. That will never give you a chance to learn. Yeah, so. definitely. And and why was it? I think that the, the the mindset thing is the really interesting piece because if you if you had to describe one key thing that codifies what it means to have an architect mindset, what would you say that is? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? Yeah, so if if you were to say that there was one key thing that would make you have an architect's mindset, so one key pillar almost of, of an architect's mindset, what would you say that would be? So let me tell you, uh, as a developer, we think about a user story. Mm -hmm. If it's a user story, it's assigned to me, I have to deliver in two weeks. And I don't think more than that. Being a tech lead, I only think about a module or a uh, what I'm working, what my team is working. I don't think about anything more than that. If I'm working on lead management, I'm thinking on lead management. If somebody else is working on integration, I don't care about them. I never think what they are doing, how they're impacting. And once you want to be architect, you need to make your mind bigger. Think about a bigger picture. Hey, what everything's happening in a whole project. What is the business process? what you are building and when you think about look into the bigger picture you will become architect you don't need to resolve the problem technically you need to understand the business problem and then solve it you will become architect so that is a bigger difference between developer tech lead and architect you have to look into bigger picture you have to think about when you are solving the problem today as a developer you come you solve the problem but you don't think about it this will this will this code will be work after a year or not they don't care about it but once you think about scalability performance and the last data volume your mindset change you're thinking like an architect that is the first step and then you thinking about uh, after six months and then you're thinking of overall application standpoint hey this is my project how the end-to-end -end flow will work how the data will flow why this is happening once you you will have a question as a why in your mind always you become architect that's a, i think that's a really really good way of of thinking about that difference in that and you know and that is a key pillar i think the especially given given the way that salesforce now is becoming much harder to to have a grasp around and to you know more projects are involving more things i think having that that high level view is the bit that kind of allows you to put those pieces in place so so, well, as I say, congratulations on on getting the book published, and I'm really looking forward to reading my copy. So, so I suppose the the kind of final big question I've got for you then is is what's next for you, Amit? I mean, you've got you know you've got a huge YouTube channel that's sharing loads of amazing content, and you're really helping the community there. You've got um, you know the book out; it's been launched, and you know, as I say, I. I can only own, only commend anyone for getting a book published because it is a it is a labor of love getting it out there. 
you know, what's, what's next for you? What are you working on now? Or are you going to take a bit of a break and kind of think about things? You know, what's next? I'm just enjoying my passion right now. So uh, definitely uh, what I'm doing, I'll keep doing it continues and uh, consistency is the key. I'll keep doing it. And uh, regarding the next project, I still need to think about something big. And definitely I'm going to focus more on the certification standpoint. And very few less people know I also play cricket. <laughs> so that's what I'm enjoying right now. Yeah. Playing cricket. Are you a, are you a batsman, a bowler, or an all-rounder? Bowler. A bowler. Okay. What type of bowler? Fast spin? Fast. Oh wow! So yeah, it's so, uh, it's. I actually finished my Atlanta uh, Atlanta cricket leagues. I'm glad to say, like uh, I'm the I'm in like top three bowlers. Oh, fantastic! Atlanta league, there are around hundred plus cricket teams are playing, and uh, I'm I like good. Uh, glad to say, like I'm enjoying my passion because I miss that passion at, when I was a kid because of lots of other things. But uh, at this stage, I'm enjoying my passion. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's that's great to hear, and a very very good thing to be spending your time doing as well. I'm off. To, I'm off to go see England play the West Indies in a couple of weeks' time. So, uh, it's uh, uh, I I share a love of cricket with you. So, um, so thank you, you know, thank you for being here today and sharing all these things. I mean, I, yeah, there's lots that I've picked up on throughout our conversation and, and learned from you. The one of the biggest things is is just your your drive and push for for helping the community and if i could if i could give everyone personally one thing to take away from it uh, from this conversation and one thing i'm going to take away from the conversation um of all of the things is that that drive of helping the community and helping people share their knowledge as it's a real multiplier um and the more you give in the more you'll get back you know in, in kind of doing so so it's really amazing to see that. One of the things that uh, we always ask everyone who features on Cloudbytes Conversations is if they have one tip they would like to share with the listeners or those watching at home um, to help them improve their career, help them you know, improve the way they're learning or to do something different. What's one tip that you would give people to help them in their lives? Focus is the key. Whatever you are doing it, just focus on it and you can achieve whatever you want. That's what I always say to the people. If you want to do something, don't get distracted. Just get focused on one thing, one thing at a time, and you can deliver anything. Personally, professionally, mentally, everywhere. That is a fantastic piece of advice and one that... Um... One that I'm going to say we could all do with, uh, I know that, you know, it's from my side of the fence. Uh, I often don't perhaps have the focus I need on things as well. So that's a fantastic bit of advice. Thank you once again, Amit, for coming on uh, Cloudbytes Conversations. It's been lovely having you here. And thank you to all those who have listened and watched. If you've enjoyed this episode and are, you know, and are on YouTube, please leave a like and leave a little comment of what you've learned from Amit today. If you're listening, please, again, leave a review and give us a rating um, on iTunes or whatever platform you're using as it really does uh, help us spread all these wonderful stories. Please remember to subscribe. And uh, once again, please say thank you to Amit for coming on today and joining us. Thank you so much, Amit. Thank you so much, Paul, for having me in the channel. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you all on the next episode.